it's time to take a look at some of those front pages that have reached us here. The I says disabled children are still being denied access to their savings. It says tens of thousands of families are battling to unlock trust funds established for every child in the UK under former Labour Chancellor Gordon Brown. And moving on to the Telegraph, they are saying that medical strikes, as we've just been discussing, are to blame for increased fatalities in the NHS. Junior doctors are being accused of putting politics above patient safety. Well, hello, chaps. Welcome to you. Lots to talk about. It's an interesting story. Obviously, lots of the front pages talking about uh, Mary Quant, um, but lots of serious stories as well. Let's just start um, with the strikes and the A&E uh, waiting times. Caroline, this is a story that is really frightening for people when you look at some of these statistics. You've got, you know, some hospitals, 30% of people are waiting more than 12 hours. And that was one of Rishi Sunak's flagship promises. Yeah, and we've seen some progress made on elective waiting times with those waiting longest. That has reduced slightly. We know that the government's put £8 billion into the elective recovery plan. But we've also seen in today's or tomorrow's Telegraph the commentary from the Office of National Statistics that the junior doctor strike was costing lives triple mm. the rate of uh, excess deaths when the doctors were out on strike last time. Now, that sends a really chilling uh, message to us all that actually that, that oath first do no harm. Well, we can see these strikes are doing harm. People are dying as a result of them. We know from Steve Barclay, the health secretary, that uh, he's said that he is absolutely open to meeting with ACAS and to uh, conciliation that way. But I think it's important that, that we see progress. And I think that's going to be very difficult with the nurses now looking set to reject yeah. that pay offer. And it was funny, in some ways, the nurses looked to a lot more adult in the way that they were um, talking about their strike compared to the junior doctors, which... And I just wonder, from the Labour Party's point of view, we were talking earlier about where streeting coming out, of course, the Labour um, health spokesman, coming out with you know, a very strongly worded statement about the A&D uh, wait times. But the strikes are slightly more difficult because he's not really on board with the junior doctors strike, is he? No, Labour has sort of struggled to say mm. what its own negotiating position would yeah. be if it were in government. And so it sort of called for talks to happen. And of course, we know that at the moment they're slightly stalled because the government's refusing to even accept or countenance talks happening until the junior doctors drop their sort of starting point of 35%. Which is huge, let's be, let's it is. be honest and, I mean, about it. I mean, remember that the nurses were asking for 19%, I think, originally, and that was also deemed to be, um, you know, much greater than could be afforded. But still, the government brought them in round the table. So hopefully, this sort of discussion about uh, bringing in ACAS, the arbitration service, might prove fruitful. But I think we're already seeing that the government knows that there is um, some political capital that can be gained here because it's got to try and win back hearts and minds, right? We know that a lot of public sympathy for strikers lies with um, sort of NHS workers. So it's probably going to try and... The government is probably going to try and use... Uh, these stats about excess, excess deaths. There's a government source quoted on the front of the Telegraph saying that the BMA is playing politics with people's lives. Will the dial start to shift? We'll have to see because the standoff just looks like it's going to continue. Um, let's have a quick look at the front of The Guardian, your paper, um, or read senior Tories turn against Braverman's racist rhetoric. I mean, it, it, it's an obvious story for The Guardian to go on. Then there's that lovely picture of Mary Quant um, above. Um, but this is interesting, isn't it, that, that, that there seems to be... There's some blue-on-blue blue fighting going on. Yes, and, and for now, it's been sort of relatively self-contained. So I think there are a few Conservative MPs who want to kind of go on the record and voice their displeasure. But there is uh, one former senior minister from Boris Johnson's government, in fact, who says that they believe that Swella Braveman is a real racist bigot, of course, something that she would completely deny. Now, this is become a sort of issue that's attracted more attention because Swella Braveman seems keen to insert herself wherever possible into issues where she thinks that she can uh, show that she wants to kind of take a hard line. So that I'm going to have to give before we... We've only got a few seconds, but are you a camp Braverman or are you uneasy about her language? Well, look, Swella's got a really difficult job to do. I was very conscious when I had the immigration brief in government many years ago now that you have to be careful about not only the language you use but the tone that you use it in. And I do think that the government needs to be very careful when talking about invasions of people who are actually fleeing war and persecution across the globe. 
And it's extraordinary to have a former chairwoman of the Conservative Party calling a Conservative Home Secretary racist. I mean, that's strong stuff. Um, and Saida has a long track record of being very vocal, particularly around Islamophobia. Um, and, you know, she, she is a very senior voice and one that the government has to reckon with.